our most wanted leak list um, a little more in detail and also talk about um, documents, the nature of documents and especially uh, the nature of um, sourcing documents um, in particular. So by what means these documents might come to us, um, by what means people can get access to interesting documentation or where documents in society are even placed or where they can be found. So it's a kind of a, com kind of a complex topic but we'll hopefully be able to cover this in some detail as well. Um, I'm just waiting for an extension for the video so we can put up the list on the beamers and I think meanwhile maybe Julian will be talking to you a bit about sourcing documents. Okay. Uh, thank you Daniel. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, okay, so this is going to be a fairly interactive presentation um, mostly because we don't have a whole lot of material and the VGA cable is not working but also, uh, the nature of what we're doing and what we hope uh, you will do um, really requires that. Uh, so first of all, how many people were at the first uh, uh, talk at uh, 12 today? Great. Is there anyone who wasn't at the talk at 12 today? Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, so it's, it's about half and half. Uh, so is there anyone who doesn't know approximately what WikiLeaks is? A couple. Okay. So for, tho for those couple who don't know or have probably been uh, misled by the yellow press, um, uh, WikiLeaks is a project of Sunshine Press. Sunshine Press is a collaboration between uh, journalists, technical people, uh, cyberpunks, some anti-corruption people, and some fairly famous uh, civil rights activists to try and get as many documents as possible out onto the internet that have never been released before that will uh, produce positive political uh, reforms. So get them out where they haven't been published before and also get them in. So that means providing uh, censorship resistance for publication and also sourcing uh, anonymization for sourcing. So two people are affected by retributive acts uh, for documents that are published. Publishers, journalists who work on uh, stories about those documents and also sources who provide those documents. So that whole, pi that whole pipeline needs to be protected. And we try and do this with uh, technology, uh, with law by picking correct jurisdictions and by having a good legal team uh, and by politics, by, real, by the real politic, which means making it very unprofitable in a political sense uh, and in a legal sense and sometimes financial sense um, to sue us. So as an example, uh, Bank Julius Baer, who did try and sue us in California last year uh, and did not succeed, um, suffered a cost of $300 million dollars for their attempt to sue us uh, in the reduction of their stock price and in the cancelling of the US IPO. So people have seen that uh, attacking us while you might be able to do it legally is actually not in the interests of the corporation that is doing it. Although sometimes it is in the interests of the lawyers who are doing it, even though it's not in the interests of their clients. Um, so I want to give maybe just one example to begin with and then we'll ask some questions um, uh, about what type of documents you might be able to help uh, uh, us get out to the public. So when you think of a document that might achieve some significant political reform, you're, you're probably thinking something like uh, these torture memos by you, as an example, in the United States. Something that may be top secret, it may be vaulted, very limited number of people have it, may not even be in electronic form. Those things are hard to get. Uh, sometimes we get them electronically, but usually for those very, very restricted documents, it's people in 
a political circle or intelligence circle who have access to that material it's being distributed to. And so it's come, come to us at a fairly high level. Sometimes it comes at a much lower level. So consultants going into some place or a janitor or secretary or someone finding a USB stick on the train or a web admin or a computer hacker um, working for an uh, intelligence agency or the police will give us that material. But there are other types of material uh, that are sort of, uh, if, if you're targeting them, you have got know you've got a fairly good chance of success and there's usually not too much legal complication. So an example is the Congressional Research Service uh, reports that we released from the United States Congress earlier this year. So we released about 6,800 uh, Congressional Research Service reports. The CRS is Congress's intelligence arm. It's intelligence analytical arm. Uh, it's worth about $100 million per year. Um, and it produces reports on all legislation before Congress and issues of contention in the United States. And congressional members can release these reports if they feel it fits their political agenda. And sometimes they do. Maybe a third of reports are released. They're also very frequently updated. They're topical. Now, we received information about a small vulnerability inside the Congress's um, document distribution system. So this is a very trivial vulnerability that has to do with HTTP headers. Um, I don't want to specify exactly what that is, but it is not complex. Any one of you here uh, could have found it if you were looking for that material. This is not about exploiting a security vulnerability in Apache or some complex uh, vulnerability in Ethernet driver. This is um, what any one of you would find if you were actually looking. Now, US government documents are uncopyrightable uh, as a matter of law. So if you get them out, there's no problem with distribution afterwards. Uh, in terms of classifications, there's no problems with uh, breaking those classifications as a matter of law if you're giving them to a press organization and you're not a serving member of the United States military. So CIA agents, as an example, can leak uh, top secret classified documents as a matter of law to the press without any retribution. Top secret is just a, a label that's stamped on something by a bureaucrat. It, it means nothing as a matter of law. Of course, as a matter of practice, um, you may be harassed a bit. Sorry, not you, but uh, people who are employees and who are discovered may be harassed a bit. But there has actually never been a successful case of prosecuting someone in the United States for leaking a top secret document to the United States press, uh, including uh, that of Daniel Ellsberg. Okay, um, so maybe I'll ask the first question why Daniel is, is still working on this. Uh, so a question uh, about sourcing. I should say that uh, I am a journalist and I have had many years of experience in dealing with uh, secret documents from all around the world and protecting sources. I have never lost a source to my knowledge. Um, WikiLeaks has never lost a source to its knowledge. Uh, so it's actually a lot easier uh, than many people think. You hear about uh, all the cases that fail. Whenever you see in the newspaper, maybe the first third of the New York Times on a good day is actually all based upon leaks. And you will just see documents seen by the New York Times. And no one actually thinks, no one imagines in that head that behind documents seen by the New York Times is actually a source of some kind that has come forward quite successfully and then gone back on with their life or uh, enjoyed their ma the moment of fame, um, but privately. But when someone is caught uh, on those rare occasions, then of course it becomes a bit of a cause celebrity, so that's what sticks in people's head. But sourcing is actually incredibly safe. Um, in my experience. Uh, okay, so a uh, question. Anyone? Okay, I, j just a second, sorry, the, the video is up. So, uh, for those people who weren't at the talk earlier, uh, 
I was approached last year by a Dutch IT consultant who said, we really want to help you get this material. And I have access to a lot of, I have access to a lot of stuff, uh, but I don't know which stuff is going to have political impact and which stuff journalists are interested in. Do you have a list? And no, we didn't have a list. And we thought we would uh, try and make a list. And uh, so we, I asked around and uh, got our, uh, our other people to ask around, uh, human rights lawyers uh, in the third world, um, journalists uh, in Europe and the United States, and a whole lot of uh, activists who, uh, internet activists who nominated material, a lot of censorship related material. And uh, we put together our, a list uh, of uh, material that uh, these people want and have gone through it and, and tried to organize it. Um, so that list is a, a great starting point for anyone who doesn't know uh, what to look at or, or where to look for it. Um, an example that is on that list that, okay, can't see here. For the United States, um, these, these big document repositories, uh, like the CRS reports, which is about a, a billion dollars worth of reports that we release for CRS. Uh, so uh, in distributing that to the world, if you like, we have uh, released a billion dollars worth of public intelligence to the world that has then gone on to be used everywhere. Um, funnily enough, even the State Department doesn't have access to the stuff by Congress. So all the time we see links and referrals coming in from the State Department, from, from embassies or around the world in the United States. Um, so another example like that CRS list, uh, good material, is the CIA runs an open source, what it calls open source, which is very different to what you guys mean. But by the intelligence agencies, when they say open source, what they mean is uh, we didn't steal it. <laughs> when you guys say open source, you mean you can steal it. So uh, anyway, so they comb uh, Facebook, the internet, um, all the foreign broadcasts they have people listening to and noting them down. Those are all open sources because they're public. But they can be very obscure. And CIA analysts are then paid to analyze these open sources and pull together information. And that can be quite sophisticated, uh, that work, and a lot of money goes into it. So the CIA Open Source Center produces these reports, but it doesn't have to worry about protecting its sources because its sources are, in fact, the open media somewhere or something on the internet. But the reports are still can be first rate. And that uh, database has millions of documents in it uh, from uh, transcripts of, of overseas, but also these complex analysis of power structures uh, in North Korea, uh, in Iran, uh, any big issue that um, uh, intelligence managers in the United States uh, want to know about. To get access to that database is not so hard, although uh, how, how many documents you're transferring per second and things like this is fairly closely watched. So all you have to do to get access to it is to have a .gov email address or a .mil email address. And you write in and ask. You need to give a consistent IP. To use a consistent IP, if you're using Tor, you'll have to use a US exit server or something that is fairly consistent. And uh, so we have received a number of documents from that. Also, Stephen Aftergood from the Federation of American Scientists has had a number of documents from that. But really, what should happen is we should get all documents from that. And all the documents from CIA open source database would be a, a great bit of information for many people in the world, uh, many people that can't afford, uh, many smaller governments that can't afford to have their own CIA producing reports. Uh, so per perfectly doable. Another example is the PACER database. So this is actually a public, rec these are pu public US court records. All the time, uh, big corporations have been sued in the United States under things like uh, the False Claims Act, the QUITAM Act, uh, where lawyers get a percentage of the profits of any um, fines against these corporations, and they're suing each other. But the records are behind a pay system. But the records themselves are completely public. 
Now, earlier this year, someone squirreled out 10% of the PACER database. Um, the guy who invented RSS, actually. Uh, he, he, he likes to call uh, that part of the, the movement which we have in common is guerrilla open source. So opening up these public records, which should be public, but uh, for some reason constrained. That has millions and millions of records. And uh, if that was Googleable, um, all the uh, many, many activists and uh, lawyers and uh, journalists would be able to discover things in these filings that uh, hasn't previously been revealed. Um, anyway, big, big list there uh, for the United States. Uh, a lot of important documents. I, I give these examples as something that we know is achievable. Um, these two previous examples, something we know is achievable and it's a sizable volume of stuff. You're not just going after one document. Um, so perhaps a question or do you want to say something? Okay, so a uh, question. Uh, just a comment on the PACER database. Um, I had a, well, anybody can sign up for an account, but you're right, it does cost money to download those files. Uh, with the bankruptcy court filings, they used to have social security numbers of people in those bankruptcy filings, and I pulled down you know, a bunch of it. I don't know if it's censored at this point, but that was all public record. Yep. I, I'm not sure what the, the question was. Comment. And another comment or question? Yes, um, I apologize if this was answered in the first lecture, I wasn't here. Um, you talk about uh, a lot about legal protection and you know how you deal with threats uh, from big governments and big money. How do you deal with physical threats and were there actually any physical threats or actions against your team or you know anything associated with WikiLeaks? Yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of people watch too many American movies. <laughs> and actually I have never felt in a position where I'm physically threatened uh, except in some third world countries in Africa uh, where uh, six armed men broke into my compound at 3 a.m. in the morning to, to do something. And some, fellow, some colleagues uh, have also suffered. Uh, some were killed, uh, some had to flee a country. Uh, but that has to do with, um, they were very public people. Uh, they were involved in a very, very tense political situation. Uh, the, the writing was very clear to everyone. And some people uh, didn't, a couple of people didn't read that writing and unfortunately were killed. Um, but in European countries, in Western countries, uh, that's not an issue at all. The, the worst that has happened uh, to us is that we've been followed occasionally. Um, I mean, big deal. I, I, I wish, you, you know, every journalist wants to spend a few days in jail, but no more. <laughs> um, that's just something you put on the CV or something to tell the grandchildren. And working out how far you can push things to a few days or so you have to leave the country for a little while and come back uh, is, is sort of an intelligence that people develop over time. But if, if you're anonymous, um, that's not an issue. If you're in the West uh, and you have someone behind you, especially if you have an organisation behind you, a group that's willing to defend you, press that is willing to defend you, uh, that's a non-issue. Uh, as, as long as, you know, as, as long as you, well, maybe an example, here's what not to do. So we, we had um, a guy, a son of a Tennessee Democrat, um, uh, son of a Tennessee Democrat, uh, who hacked Sarah Palin's account uh, using a password reset. Actually, a lot of people criticised this guy for, you know, this was a trivial hack, anyone could do it. But actually, only he did do it. So he had enough political sense and uh, the will to do it that he did it. Now, of course, then this was a very young person and they immediately went and told 4chan all about it under their real name. Um, okay, so we got the material, we protected him completely from our end, but 
you know, he gave his, gave his, his handle and name and plenty of details to 4chan. So um, that's an example of what not to do. Just act like an adult and uh, don't tell all your, all your drinking buddies immediately and, uh, until you see uh, what the political fallout is. Usually, uh, if the political fallout is high, that's good. If you reveal the matter that exposes some injustice, that's usually good. Uh, because it means everyone is so busy dealing with the political fallout uh, that they actually have no time to investigate the source. Um, trying to think of an example where that hasn't been true. Uh, for us, uh, I don't think there is one. The, the, attorney, the, um, the attorney General in, sorry, not the Attorney General, the Inspector General in the United States is still, in, still investigating the, um, the CRS leak uh, but, you know, it's, it's completely obvious to me. Uh, but I don't know why they're still investigating it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an obvious thing. Um, yes, we had... Actually, I won't mention that. But we were given details <laughs> about uh, how to access that material. Um, but, of course, that is not a, not a crime. And, in fact, even just giving us all the material is not a crime. It's... If a, Congress, if a Congress member gives us all the CRS leaks, this violates a very small Senate rules uh, thing, which is really you know, not, not of much consequence. Things that are of consequence is after that leak, um, a number of US newspapers reported on it, and uh, Senator McCain and Lieberman um, then proposed to release all of them per, on a permanent basis, given that they were just being leaked anyway. Uh, and that would actually be a great outcome. That bill is still before the Senate, and we'll see what happens. Um, one more comment, though, on this physical security issue. Um, if you're... Uh, the way that WikiLeaks is structured is um, there are many people involved that are addressing parts of the work that needs to be done for this project. And then there's a few people that, have an, that, are, that appear on the stage somewhere like here. So maybe these people have a slight higher public exposure and if there would be physical threats, these people would have to live with that. But I guess anyone who thinks more than two minutes about engaging into something like this would realize that there are many more people involved that are still doing this work. So it wouldn't really help intimidating anyone or threatening any single person. Um, it would actually just blow back in your face because you would I mean, it would become clear maybe who is uh, pressuring someone. Um, this would get publicity. You would maybe have to defend yourself, be very careful about how you approach these things. So it, it wouldn't really make any sense, at least from my perspective, to put anyone into any physical trouble. And I'm, I mean, I'm not really scared of anything in that respect. So, and, we, and the whole project is structured in a way that n no one that is public can be compromised that then would compromise the whole project in a way that it ceases to exist or cannot be continued anymore or anything similar to that. So I, I think that what was what your question was aiming at. It's also psychologically very important if you're doing this that you do not show that fear, or you do, not, you do not promote that fear to others. That's a very important part as, we, as well in respect to talking to all of you whom we would like to motivate to do some useful work maybe, um, as well as to all the sources we have that put much more uh, on the line in some cases than, than we do. Uh, so for us, maxi it's maximum some legal trouble. That is a little uncomfortable, I guess, but for someone who is risking his whole career path or maybe the stability he can offer for his family by doing something for them, it's a completely different story. So the focus has to be to protecting these people. And that's where also, I guess, a physical end is more important than with what we're doing. Is there any question? Ah, yeah. Yes, I'm a German journalist, uh, sometimes um, um, receiving content which might be of interest from WikiLeaks. Why should I choose WikiLeaks instead of, uh, let's say, 
um, a German um, coalition like uh, Chaos Computer Club, which is always receiving documents and uh, freeing them anonymously. Okay, so um, there are a couple of aspects to this question. Uh, the first question is um, um, in respect to whom to publish with. Uh, if you look at what Cryptome, for example, is doing, which on some level might be similar to what we are doing as well. So it is a long, they have a long history of publishing information that partly has been withheld from, from the public. So the problem is that um, most websites that might publish this material in fully would not really be able to promote it to, to the media, to the public. Um, these organizations like the Chaos Computer Club are not they are not existing to actually actively bring material into the public and make sure that it receives attention and that it also um, receives the impact it deserves. So that might be one point why it's different publishing it with an entity that is journalistically oriented rather than just with an entity that might be interested in the subject. Um, the second point, um, in general is that uh, what we are doing is we're aiming at making sure that the material we publish remains online for the public as a publication for eternity basically. So um, in the long run that's the goal we are aiming at. So um, the Chaos Computer Club or I mean I'd, I think the Chaos Computer Club is a, maybe a bad example but any other entity that is not specifically there as a publishing entity might not share the same value for keeping this information online in, in the same way that you would like to see it online. So there surely are many ways to publish material but from our perspective, especially if the material is anyhow um, problematic for you as a source, it's very important that it's done right and that people take care of a lot of detail that comes along with such a submission. So I hope that answered. I'm not sure Julian might have another comment on that. So. Yeah, just a, a small comment on that. Um, if the material is um, relevant to a particular geographic community, you, your best uh, way of getting the story out is to publish, say, in some newspaper that is very popular in that region and have that newspaper also release the material uh, concurrently with us. There are problems in that... In, as far as protecting the source is concerned. We have seen uh, many cases where uh, newspapers have not correctly uh, removed metadata information from material they released uh, and sources have been revealed. As a result, they don't have uh, continual expertise in how to do that. And sometimes uh, the material itself can be legally problematic. Very often newspaper websites will refuse to release any commercial document as an example. Um, sometimes in the UK, often uh, any government document because there's Crown copyright. The United States is quite good for uh, if releasing US government uh, documents, but not for commercial documents. There's a high chance to be litigated. So combined release is also possible. Uh, if you're if you're writing a story for a newspaper, then we take the, the legal, as one journalist said, so what you're saying is you guys take all the legal risk and I get all the fame. And the answer is yes. So we're, we're specialized in dealing with the legal risks in keeping the document up. People, when they attack legally, will attack the, the easiest part uh, in a legal sense to attack, which is usually the provision of the full document and not the story. Now that depends a little bit on the country they, and the motivation. They actually may be motivated just to beat the journalist around a bit uh, by wasting their time in court and there's nothing precisely that we can do about that except to make it very clear uh, that the material is not going to go away. Uh, so further court actions tend to just draw more attention to the material and it becomes counterproductive. Um, um, maybe another side comment that also 
comes, uh, comes in with this topic, I think. Uh, what we would like to ultimately promote is that journalists in general, um, at some point in time, release their sourcing material with us. At least everything that is not so confidential that it would really, or so critical um, for the source protection that it cannot be released. But in general, we think that it would be very good for the media if um, source material was disclosed at one place in full so that every journalist can also be independently verified on his story so that anyone would be able to research the same source material that the journalist use and come to the same conclusions and find out that he, what he's doing is a good job and he, that he's writing credible news stories and not some weird propaganda that you wouldn't be able to detect if you did not have the source. So that is um, one thing we would like to establish in the future or one mechanism that we would like to offer. And that hopefully will become an incentive to release material with us then as well. Hello. Uh, do you have any material from China or Russia? And do you have uh, personnel who know Chinese or Russian to evaluate your material? I didn't hear the second um, part of the question. Uh, do you have, and do you have uh, people who know, you know other languages like, like Russian or Chinese to evaluate the material? Or are you just working in you know, these Western languages? Yeah, so we, we do have contacts with people that know a variety of languages. Uh, so often if we get an important document in, we will uh, find someone who knows that language. Sometimes that can be quite hard. Uh, so, and we do have documents in Chinese and Russian, uh, some very important documents uh, in Chinese. Uh, as an example, all the censorship keywords used by Badu, which is the Chinese Google, censorship keywords used by State TV, um, censorship political logs of what things need to be censored uh, and who needs to be contacted, um, uh, propaganda activities related to the uh, 60th uh, Chinese Communist Party um, celebrations that are coming up. But yes, we need uh, more people with um, non-European languages uh, involved at a closer level uh, so they can be continually consulted. At the moment, it's a, it's a process of reaching out to friends of friends uh, who might know that language. Um, and uh, we also need help with uh, additional translations of um, uh, the website itself, how to use it, uh, and for sourcing. Um, that can also be an issue when people are trying to source material uh, from a foreign country and they don't know the language. Um, that can often pose significant uh, barriers. Um, there, are many, there are many former colonies, however, that do speak uh, European languages that are not part of Europe. Uh, and we've seen a lot of documents for, from those um, which have been partially smuggled out by uh, Europeans. Hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, have you been trying to promote the kind of principle that uh, government should uh, publish all the documents automatically? So have you been trying to um, um, make things so that uh, governments automatically uh, make some documents like, like the CRS uh, public? No? Did you understand anything? A little, the audio is a little bad. Uh, you, the question was if we promote open government or if we... Uh, have you tried to uh, convince governments to publish the data automatically without kind of being leaked, like you said about the CRS, that yeah. why don't we uh, publish it uh, automatically as it's uh, going to be leaked? So. No. Does anyone understand the question? Yeah. 
I think it was uh, the question if you lobbied for um, automatic uh, release of documents directly with uh, government. Yeah, so I, I think I understand what you're, what you're saying. You're suggesting after a time period, as an example, documents are automatically released uh, to us or in general? In general. In general. Well, it'd be a great thing. Uh, certainly, uh, some in the United States have lobbied for things to be automatically declassified at particular dates and released. Uh, that doesn't seem like it will happen. Um, there's too many forces that are pushing against it. Uh, it's mainly sort of ass covering what happens if it goes wrong and one document is released, someone gets blamed, but no one gets proper credit for all the good uh, that is done. Um, in Europe, I'm not sure what the situation with that is. Uh, for the CRS, certainly we've lobbied a bit, but others have done a lot of lobbying. But um, we are specialist leakers. You know, we, we work where the traditional civil society fails. Uh, and the Freedom of Information Act is an example of something that uh, is abused and is failing. Um, as an example, the EFF, through the legal system, uh, tried uh, to... Yeah, there's, a, there's a transnational um, treaty that has been plotted over the past two years in relation to copyright, ACTA. So we released the first documents about ACTA. It was not on the political agenda at all of any activists in this community or uh, in uh, developing world patent medicine. And the EFF then tried to FOI that material. Other groups tried to FOI that material in the United States. It was uh, classified as a national security secret, even though it's just a copyright treaty, uh, and I, under the basis that United States copyright holders' positions might be marginalized in the negotiations and they wouldn't make as much profit. Uh, and the EFF uh, just uh, one month ago gave up on that case uh, because it was their legal belief that this, the state saying that something was a national, of a matter of national security was extremely hard to break because the court wouldn't be happy to open the document to see if it was as a matter of national security. So, this, it is important to attack uh, with two prongs. One prong is provide an official, if you like, leak system, which is the Freedom of Information Act. And then also, on the other hand, the unofficial system, which is people engaging in civil disobedience um, and smuggling out material that's been withheld uh, from legal restrictions or just bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic restrictions. To some extent, things like the Freedom of Information Act are there because um, if you don't legalize it, then it, it will all be done in a, uh, I shouldn't say illegal, but in a, in a, in a way that is not uh, managed by the law. So the more leaking there is, um, the more aggressive leaking there is, the more things like the Freedom of the Information Act are empowered. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Kara with the Meta Lab. Uh, less a question, more a suggestion. Really, you talk a lot about the American situation, you know, Freedom of Information Act and all documents created by the government being not under uh, copyright, which is awesome, but it's not the same way in most places of the world. And so I wonder if you have thought about creating a directory of the legal information for each country. I know this is a shitload of work and you'd need a legal expert in each country, but maybe you might want to start on that so I can go and say, okay, I'm in Austria. Uh, I can know exactly what my situation is. What about government documents? What happens if I take a document from my corporation that I feel violates some ethical principle that I stand for and I release this and I get fired as a result or I get sued for having violated some kind of NDA or what have you? Um, what would be my situation, what would be my, you know, legal position, and so on. This kind of information for, for each country. Have you thought about doing something like that? Uh, no, <laughs> I haven't thought about it, but it's, a, it's a, a very interesting idea. What we've found in the past in dealing with 
something as analogous with sources is that each case tends to be so unique uh, that we can't give someone a book and say, read this and your question will be solved. So I think uh, what you're referring to, before releasing a document, uh, you should come to us and talk to us about the specific situation. And we'll then speak to our lawyers, or we may already know the answer, and we'll come up with a tailored solution uh, just for you. That's what we do with sources. We come up with some tailored way, um, some of our sources, a tailored way for them to get the information out uh, safely um, and in a way which will have the maximum political impact. And I think for, for IT consultants, uh, that should work as well. This, um, this is a similar problem also with the usage of PGP for email encryption, for example. Um, the problem is if you put some information out and you encourage someone to regard that information as paramount or as what is, what is there and that's all you need and if you read this, you understood all you need to take care of, then um, this has to be 100% complete. There is not, no possibility of a mistake in there or something missing that somebody hasn't thought of. So we are very careful with putting out guidelines that we advocate as use this and you'll be secure, use this and you'll be safe. All these things are very difficult. Um, and similar, that's why we're not advocating the use of PGP because too many people have a feeling of false safety when using email encryption and then there's a mistake and we would just rather encourage them getting in touch with us and clarifying how we can offer them the dedicated solution they need for their problem. But I understand that doesn't really scale very well for the common public. So. You are constantly talking about what kind of stuff is protected in the U.S. You, are, you have been doing it all evening, and it's great. And I think nobody yeah, well, now well. believes, oh, and this is the ground truth, and they are safe and all that. But this is about like general guidelines, general ideas. Uh, I was just thinking it might be good to have it. Okay. You know, it? Because getting in touch with you may already be too much. It may already be more than I want to do. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, you, yeah. Well, there are, I could now say use Tor and we have an anonymous encrypted chat and these things. But I understand your point and it's a valid point and we'll happily think about it. And we're not at all US focused. I'm an Australian, Dan Daniel is German. Um, we have, certainly have some US people, but we're, the reason uh, that we mention so much is just such a big body of people and because of the, the past eight years of war, uh, there has been a lot of dissidents from the US that have come forward and, and also it's seen as, in terms of its uh, intelligence bureaucracy, as the most aggressive case. So if this is a case you can solve effectively, uh, all the others are to some extent easier. That's actually not true. Places like North Korea are harder. But um, you can see that this aggressive case can be solved. The European countries are, are, are fairly easy. UK is, I mentioned these uh, problems with publishing. But all the publishing problems, this is our problem. Um, and we know how to deal with that. The, so the sourcing problems, uh, that's uh, you got your problem, um, but we try and make it our problem as much as possible. If, I mean, if you're suggesting that uh, you would like to do some research and find out uh, what the situation is for various whistleblower protection laws in, in your country or um, the classification laws in your country and who those apply to, do they apply to outside consultants, do they apply to enlisted military, and most importantly, not what the law says, but what actually happens in practice. Because the law is just a piece of paper. And it's, it's what uh, the precedents and communal values and the expectations of society uh, are that defines whether that law uh, becomes more than a piece of paper to individuals in that society. Usually it's just a piece of paper because the real politic constraints are such that it can't be used. 
Uh, okay, we already had the, yeah, there are two minutes left. I guess we'll, if there's one more um, urgent question or any other questions, we'll be around anyways um, in the next few days. So thanks for your uh, interest, for coming here tonight, even though it's so late and cold. Um, we brought some t-shirts. Whoever wants to buy one, we'll have a few for sale here or the rest at the tent. I just hope I don't have to drive any of them at home again. So... Uh, thanks again, and everyone have a first nice evening at Har. Sorry? Sorry? Uh, medium, large, extra large, and girl shirts. Sorry. Uh, 20, 20 euros. 20 euros. It all goes to a very good cause. Yes.